the eating experience. Now, here's a, some eating experiences that are described there in those photographs. Eating experiences can be many and varied. They can be eating on the run, finger food such as we've had today, or it can be a full sit-down meal. It can be all sorts of different things. It can be a snack. Is that a dining room that you would recognise from, maybe from a restaurant, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is actually an aged care home. It's in Germany. Let's have a look at the dining area for a moment. Think about the dining areas in your care environment. Don't want to think about it. <laughs> there, there's a question about movement. Is there good movement? Can you move around those care, those those dining spaces easily? Yeah. If it's the movement is unnecessary, then you need to eliminate it. If it's necessary, then minimise it. And if it's the medito medication trolley, don't take it in there in the first place. Keep your medication trolleys out of your care environment, out of your dining space, I should say. And preferably, separate medication from meal times. <laughs> Interesting reaction. How many of your medications have to be taken with food? And, and it's so not how many? Four meals too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Right. Just depends. Um, I know at my work, we do medications during lunch because it gives you enough gap between, say, you know, the panadols or something if they have some in the morning. It's that sort of logistical thing. It's just allowing enough time. If I, I wouldn't be able to give something like that before lunch because there wouldn't be enough gap. After lunch. I can do it. Yeah, mate, but then you're doing other things. So if there's not enough gap, yeah. let's give them at another time earlier so that there is enough gap. I think I did. In other words, let's rethink whether or not medications that are not necessarily taken with food need to be given during lunch times. It's an organisational arrangement, it's not a therapeutic arrangement. It's not disorders. Doctor's orders are really associated with the medication that needs to be given with food. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they, like, you know, uh, I understand what you're saying, but logistically, like, it takes a long time to get, like, more your medications. Mm -hmm. you, you all start straight away and go, go to that one o'clock. Yeah. But that's not doctor's yeah. orders, that's an organisational issue, isn't no, it? No, the orders no medication over time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's got nothing to do with meal times. It's really, just about really giving them an hour of time. Yeah, you're supposed to give them an hour of time. Of? Sure. But that's got nothing to do with meal time. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Has it? No. no. Well, you can change meal times to say you can change meal time that's yeah. fine. But, I mean, if you finish DDs and hand over by, let's say, 7.30, and like, you've got 25 meds due at 8, 25 persons who need their meds, they're written up for 8 o'clock, and breakfast is at 8. So then you can't wait until 9 o'clock. Then you can't wait until 9 o'clock. Mm. All we need to do is shift it away from the meal time. Yeah. But it's not practical, though. Mm -hmm. but how as do you soon as you shift it, it on, if you do it gradually over a series of days, mm -hmm. and you were to separate it from the meal time, there's nothing tying it to, uh, to meal time. All it is, is just making sure that if you change your eight o'clock to 10 o'clock, and then everything else gets shifted back two hours. I'm just giving this as an example. If, if you not Why do you need to have it at meal times? It's purely an organizational Because they've got Panadol four times a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you need four hours. So at two o'clock, that's fine. Yeah. Then then at 10 o'clock at night, maybe they're sleeping. So, so what do we do about the nighttime one? Because what if they're asleep? Sure. Well, you you start, won't do it. You start you start has four handover time. Yeah. So let's make it at another time that makes sense, away from meal time. Oh, it can't. 
ready for <laughs> time. <laughs> if only they were on tablets once, <laughs> once in a day, okay. that would yeah. yeah. really wake up yeah. something that yeah. would. Can you, can you all hear what you're doing? Just for <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, we are very positive, but we are also trying to be really practical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, that. if if it was maybe okay. they have tablets once in a day, they would say, oh, let's give them at eleven o'clock. Mm. That would be fine. Yeah. But they have got tablets that needs to be given. Maybe after four hours, you have to give another one, or after sure. six hours. Yeah. So it won't really come together. That to avoid all the meals. Okay, I understand. I understand the need. Yes. But uh, let, let, me, let me ask, <laughs> what does that have to do with meals? If it doesn't have to be taken with food, why do we hook it at meal times? If we schedule it, sure, I understand the need for them to be regular, no question. But let's shift it away from the meal time. Yes, the question then becomes, how can you do that? Yeah, because like, they give them meal time all the time together, right? And after like meal time, they're doing other things like dressings, you know, sharing, yeah. you're going to activities that might be real. Yeah, they've got to the dining room. Yeah, they might be here after the day. So let's try and find a way to do this. And they don't have one meal in a day. If only they had one meal. <laughs> <day. laughs> <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 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 If we observe what's happened here, you're going to experience exactly the sort of pushback that you just did to me mm -hmm. when you raise things with your staff yes. group. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they will be raising very reasonable concerns. Yes. The question becomes, how do you deal with that in such a way that you can then move them with you? Because you don't want to be setting up an mm. antagonism. Mm. But at the same time, you want to be able to bring them with you yep. into the group, into, into the, 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 vision. the task, yeah. Yeah. the vision of, of what you want to achieve. So if we were really tied into this, this goal of uh, you know, separating meals and, and medication, then we would need to find a way to do that so that we were engaging the whole of the staff group. <laughs> the other way to say it is, let's look at meal times in themselves and work out an, a change agenda associated with that so that we don't put separation of meal times and medications onto the table. Because it might be that that's not the best thing to do just yet. Or at all. So, in terms of change, just be thinking about how would you handle that, that sort of a situation. If you had a change agenda around dining or meal times, what are you going to, to target as an initial period of uh, initial uh, agenda for change? It might be that you get your staff group to identify that. So that it doesn't come from you, but what you do is stimulate the opportunity. And you get the staff thinking about and choosing a topic to modify or an issue to modify. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I think lunch and dinner, it's not much issue in our unit, as I can think of. Okay. Because we can avoid easily. Like, you know, we can just modify. But breakfast, I can't see any of that. You know? Okay. Yeah. That might be the case. Yeah. 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 Because dinner, like, I normally doesn't do it. Like, I do it either 4 o'clock or either after dinner, okay. which is okay. Like, 4 and 6 is okay, yeah. but most of the medication it's not doesn't have to be given at five or like with the food, so this is fine. Yeah. And I think lunch as well, like panadol as well. If you give like a little bit earlier, then give before lunch or after lunch, so which is okay. Yeah. yeah. I understand the name. But breakfast. Even before I got here, we were taking the medication at breakfast time with me. I do it. The home is aware. Aware that stuff is always the fallacy over the years. Some resident likes with the food. Yeah, they always have the same side lunch. You know that at home they probably would miss doses or probably just wouldn't take it and mm -hmm. just remember it. Um, but for us, because it's legal, we have sure. to do it a certain way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not encouraging you to do it in any uh, unprofessional way at all. 
I'm simply asking you to think about the possibility of separating it from meal time. Maybe it's a case of just starting two minutes earlier and then it's all done by. Yeah, the Nike you know, stuff. Yeah. 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 We start out. We start out. It's early. Yeah. 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 We had some issues, not from the staff, but from the residents. Like someone has got medication that around five, then they also have some medications around nine, which is not really necessary. And by that time, they are in bed, they are sleeping. They started complaining about it. Why can't you just give me everything? You know. So if it was practical, we could do that. So we had to talk to the doctors and let them know what the residents felt like. And it was necessary. It was. It was not necessary. It was okay to move those medications from nine and just combine them together with the five o'clock. Mm -hmm. So you find most of the medications now they're given around four five. That's when they get them in the morning and then around four five lunch. Maybe we've got six yeah. residents yeah. only who get there. So it's quick, quick, quick. You can give give them. Then the majority they eat. They are not disturbed. And also late in the night there are only a few medications that we give late in the night. To us, from looking from those ends, to say, oh, but really, you are disturbing them. It's not really necessary. Yeah. Except if it's a sleeping tablet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Breakfast time to seven o'clock, <laughs> and we start the meditation at eight. One of the primary reasons for wanting to separate the two is that it's an intrusion of the institution and of the medical needs into what is a social and nutritional experience. Mm. The question then becomes, if we need to do the medications during that time, how can we do it so that it's not intrusive? That would be another way to frame the question. So keep thinking about it, and I'm sure that now that we've thrown that little hand grenade into the thoughts. When you see it happen, you know, someone's enjoying their, their breakfast and someone might come on and put their mental that's the sort of intrusiveness that, as you can see, which is very blatant. The more subtle intrusiveness is when somebody is in the middle of a meal or a conversation and the nurse comes up and simply stands there and intrudes into that experience. Um, you know, and, and having your medication trolley in the middle of the dining room. You know, let's move it out. Move it. At the very least, let's move it out to the edge so it's not in that space. Okay, so let's come back to our task. <laughs> um, air quality, think about the temperature and the aroma of the dining space. Does it smell like it's a food space or does it have antiseptic smells or urine smells or faeces smells, okay? So what we want to do is stimulate appetite. So aroma of food is really important. And I've known some places where they have a cook chill approach to the food is prepared somewhere else and brought in. Where that happens and the food's not actually prepared on site, what they do is they'll, they'll try to stimulate appetite among people by taking a trolley of, of the food ready just around the corridors so that the, the, uh, the aroma of the food stimulates the appetite and it also is a cue to people to come to the dining room so that you don't have to be the ones who go and find people like crowd control. Yeah. Serving the meal itself, you can use various styles. Yesterday we saw in the video uh, in the Montessori approach a, uh, a bain-marie style approach where people choose the food they want. Mm. And it's okay if the people can choose the food, otherwise we can engage them in lots of different ways of, of the food being served. The family style service, which you see at this table here, is most home-like. It's served from large bowls at the table of up to eight people. One or two staff sit at the table, staff model appropriate eating, 
and the social life is stimulated and provides a cueing for others. You eating models how to eat for the person with dementia. Because often, the person who has cognitive impairment will watch what you're doing and will pick up the cues and adopt your eating practices. Okay? So they will model on what they see around you. I don't know how many times I've heard of people with dementia who need to be assisted to eat in an aged care home, but you take them out to a cafe and they can have a cup of coffee or a scone or something quite independently. Mm -hmm. you know, very interesting. Mm -hmm. The context and watching them watching what's appropriate from others helps them to, to be cued to do uh, appropriate to engage in appropriate eating. Um, if we're introducing finger food, and this is I would encourage you to have a finger food option. That is a really serious option for people who need um, more support with their independence, but who can actually, if they can't hold the utensils anymore, or they can't sit for long enough to have a table meal, then we need to have a finger food menu available for them. And that means something more than party pies and sandwiches, but a fully diverse, naturally balanced menu. So they, even if they don't ever actually have a full meal, what they get is full nutrition from all of the finger food that's available. Now, these are some of the examples of that. They might be cheese cubes and fruit, ham and cheese mini quiches, stuffed hard-boiled eggs, chicken strips, fish croquettes, vegetable florets, veggie burgers, banana bread, pizza bites, chicken satay, Anzac biscuits. Right? This is a complex group of things that can all be stored in small amounts in the fridge, dated, provided by the kitchen for use at, as needed. Small amounts thawed out from time to time. So the kitchen can prepare that. Really diverse, imaginative finger food menu. Now, for all of the there's three sites involved with the uh, dementia project, I have already given to each of those sites a finger food menu that is three weeks of full finger food menu that gives you a balanced diet. So if you haven't seen it, or you see no evidence of finger food menu, go and talk to the chef, because they've got it. So how often they can have? They can live on finger food, if it's a diverse, balanced diet. So if they're, you would only have a finger food menu for the people who can't sit long enough or who can't handle utensils. I think it would be more effective in our unit, like because we find most of the residents, if they see like big plate and big menu, they just don't want to touch. And if you give like even dinner time, sometimes we're ending up making like uh, toast and make toast and give it to on their hand and they will eat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, a resident who always has finger foods in the dimension unit, okay? Yeah. But I haven't checked to see if his diet has changed, so that would be interesting. I'm making fun of that. Okay. We, yeah. we don't have activities with the finger food that would be different, but it's hard different. It's just like a snack for them. Yeah. Sometimes it's it. finger food is used as just a snack, whereas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the finger food I have in mind is a meal replacement. It means that you don't have to struggle to get the person to sit all the time, mm -hmm. and they can. can it needs to be food that they can hold, mm -hmm. as that's what finger food is. But what it does require is that staff check regularly that they are getting enough over a 24 hour period, there must be some sort of recording of what they actually ingest. What's offered and what's ingested. What do they actually eat? Because the person can walk away with something in their hands and just drop it and put it down. And you want to make sure that in fact they are going to ingest it. Culturally, food is a tremendously important element of life. So 
it's a way, as we heard earlier today, to respect the person. It's an indicator of respect is to have uh, religious or ritual or food indicators of, uh, of culture. Now, we need to find out what the cultural preferences of the person may be because, for instance, just knowing that they are, um, uh, come from uh, Slovakia, for instance, doesn't necessarily mean that they enjoy soup a lot. And soup is a very common, uh, common food for, for people from those, uh, those areas. But that individual might not necessarily enjoy soup a lot. So you need to find out what are the individual preferences. You know, just because somebody's Italian doesn't mean they like pasta all the time. They might need something else so, or have preferences around it. What are the particular current preferences that they have? Because they might vary a lot from what they used to like. And this is important too around choices for drinks. The fact that somebody chose coffee with two sugars and milk on day one doesn't mean that three years later that's what they want. And yet I've seen lists on the inside of kitchen cupboard doors. <laughs> you know, Mary, coffee, two sugars. <laughs> Whereas in a life before the aged care home, she might have actually varied. Some days she liked tea, some days she liked coffee. Depends what she feels like. Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah. Right. So we don't need to be locked in. In terms of eating, it's a social experience that needs to be a whole process from planning to cleaning up. In familiar and comfortable environments, reducing distractions so that they can concentrate, providing a home-like eating experience that improves appetites and interaction. You get much more social interaction, talking, when you have staff at the table. And I'm sure you found that turn it in. It's a big thing. Use a range of interventions to support or enhance the experience. You know, um, the kitchen is a tremendously important area and I would encourage you to try to have at least a small kitchenette as part of the availability for a person um, in a dementia care environment. Having a fridge and a sink is an important part of just the cues that say that this is home. Now what you have in the fridge, I don't know, should be things that, that they can safely eat or have an interaction with foods that they can uh, interact with. Now I, I've known in extreme circumstances where somebody who had some, some very difficult behaviour uh, associated with their frontal lobe dementia um, who wanted to drink every fluid that they could get their hands on. Now that sort of obsessiveness was really difficult for the staff, so they couldn't have the fridge freely open to them because that person would just drink two litres of orange juice at a, at a go, which is dangerous. So um, they actually had to padlock the fridge, which was really difficult and awful for everybody. Um, so we need to tailor what's available to the way that people can act safely in the care environment. But um, we need to like, try to understand resident preferences too. He had preferences that were really difficult and needed a, a very different environment where he could be much more closely monitored and, uh, and cared for. Um, think about the preparation for food. How can we involve residents in that preparation, in setting the table, in preparing the vegetables? You know, we think about risk and so on associated with preparing food and, and all of that, but let's actually clean hands, clean fingernails as part of the preparation for that. Um, you know, most of us don't wear gloves when we're preparing food at home. What do we do? We wash our hands. And cleaning your hands is one of the best ways that you can prevent infection. So I would suggest that with residents, uh, if you're concerned about their hand hygiene, then let's make that part of the ritual preparation of food preparation and that will satisfy most of the, uh, you know, the, the needs around health regulations. Um, and let's not be tokenistic about the food. We need to, if you're going to have residents preparing it, make sure it's food that can then be eaten. Because I hear of 
know, the, the residents were preparing the food, but we didn't actually give that to them to eat. We just had them peeling those potatoes, but we then threw them out. And they ate different food. You know, that's, that's tokenistic. Mm. So let's try and find a, a solution that actually takes it seriously and gives them real value. Because many of them still would like to prepare food. Now some, some of them are relieved not to prepare food and they don't want to make another meal in their life. Fine, if that's what they choose. Okay, but let's give them the option. We'll make sure there's sufficient lighting, reduce the level of noise, and make sure there's contrast. You know, think about the colour of the table, the colour of the crockery, the, the plate, is there contrast between the plate and the background so that the, the resident can see where the edges of the plate are so that they can perceive where the food is and keep the food on the plate. Is the food colourful enough for the, to be interesting and actually looks enough like food? <laughs> sometimes they get food in, in front of them and I, sometimes I've been confused. I'm not sure if it's chicken or fish. It can look bland and white on a white plate against a white table and it just looks really bland. There's nothing of interest or stimulation there for it. Hold up eyes in a person whose brain has dementia. Those eyes will not pick up all of the colour distinctions and contrasts that you and I will pick up. So they need strong contrasts, edges to the plate. So that might simply be that we get a brown placemat or a different colour placemat yeah, that creates a contrast so that white plate can be seen clear. Um, get the residents involved in setting the table as we saw yesterday. Some of our residents can still do that, so let's, let's engage with that. Um, inappropriate levels of assistance. Sometimes you can have too much assistance or you can have too little assistance by staff who don't do enough for the person, you see the person just sitting there not being started off or supported with verbal prompts. And grade the assistants so that they start with a verbal prompt, then maybe verbal plus a little bit of physical assistance, and then maybe more physical assistance, graduating up to totally assisting the person to eat. Now you'll notice I'm staying away from the word feeding. Feeding is what you do to animals. Right? You eat, don't you? You don't feed. Is that correct? You do raise. You do raise. <laughs> it's an important distinction, I think, because what we are doing is assisting the person to eat. We're not feeding them. That's that one of the bees I asked me, how can you feed a baby but not the resident? Because they're not a baby. <laughs> <laughs> they're an adult. Yeah. But they need but, assistance to eat. But then she told me there's nothing wrong with the word feed, feeding for the baby. The how come it's wrong when we use to assist the elderly? That's a good question. <laughs> They're not babies. <laughs> the babies don't have the skills yet. The babies don't have the skills yet. Yeah. With the right support, the person can still be successful. Now, some people are not able to accept our support simply because they don't have the capacity to do it. And that's okay. But we're still assisting them to eat. It's a much more respectful way to speak, I think, about it. Go back to our language and all the connotations that we often have either forgotten about over time or just aren't aware of. It's just part of the Language matters. So, I, I would re respond to that person by saying that. Yeah, I told them about the elderly and not baby anymore, but then <laughs> they kept asking me, how come, like, it sounds alright when we say that we think a baby? <laughs> <laughs> it's very, it, it's sometimes when you, but like. You, you teach your children to eat, though, don't you? I don't have my yes <laughs> So when you do, Rosa. <laughs> but like it's, it's fine, you know. It's, it's like something you just like when you told me, oh, you need to tell like um, the staff not to use the correct language, right? And then we keep handing it over, having a small discussion. But then some of the question they they write, you know, 
and 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 um like you need um, I don't know. Sometimes it's I'm I'm struggling to answer these questions, even though they are basic. It's okay. It's a, it's a good question, but a very simple answer is usually enough. It's uh, simply that yeah, they're no longer babies, or, and that they are not babies. Because normally we use it's more the word "care" as well, like we don't use that feeling, yeah, so we use right. like we call full assistance, yeah. Yeah. minimal assistance. That's right. Yeah. So that's the language we use when we write. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But when we speak, we talk about how many feeds have you got? Yeah. I think the focus has like was it was a center care. Then we tell them because our people don't like this word. Because that's their preference. They don't like this word. Yes. That's that's, that's another good. very good way to put it. That yeah. this is the language that the older person prefers. Mm -hmm. Some staff will argue saying that if you use a nickname and call like lobby and stuff, then they you know Appreciate either, appreciate, and uh, being allowed to do things. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. 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 That's the language we use. So just so, because. So, <laughs> so while you're rostered on this floor, I'd like you to use that language. So I don't know it might be alright in your character, but might be with really mentioned character, it might be different. Okay. And if you have Good. any other questions that I can't explain, just ask them. Just write them down and, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go and talk to Bernie. Yeah. Uh, the mind's staff coming out from the lift, even hasn't had the hand over. How are you, darling? Mm. How are you, dear? Yeah. So, started with. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a big challenge, isn't it? To, yeah. to keep picking them up. I think it's a challenge because it's also a sort of a culture within the community as well. Yeah. Because when I also moved from Zimbabwe to here, everybody is calling me darling, darling, and I'm saying, mm -hmm. do they really mean it? Or <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it was such a big question for me to come to appreciate it. Because my question was, when they call me darling, do they really? Mm. Well, somebody, do they have affection for yeah, me? Yeah, do they really have the affection? Or is just covering it on, you know, like. Yeah. They don't know my name and they're not interested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, when people call me darling, you know, honey, when, like, the first time, second time they met me, oh, darling, how are you? It is so. This is all right, man. We, we had a carer call one of our male residents, oh darling, and he said, well actually I'm not your darling. Oh good. Yeah. And she <laughs> said, oh, oh no, I suppose not. <laughs> she was a bit put out. Yeah. She just so she know. doesn't do it again. Yeah, no, she didn't do it again. Yeah. Good, there's somebody standing in their own space. Mm -hmm. And this is what people will do if they have the verbal skills, they will say something like that. But often people with dementia don't have the verbal skills to be able to stand their ground and say, well, I'm not your darling. Mm -hmm. And so they put up with it. Now, some people do actually like that. They like the term of affection perfectly fine if that's what they prefer. And they can indicate that they prefer that. But if staff just do it out of habit, then that's not acceptable. So we've gone on to language there, but and there's there's another time where we'll talk a lot more about language. There's uh, some other labels that are really important too in the language we use because it shapes where our thinking goes, and then that shapes where we our actions go. So the language we use is really important. Okay. I was going to say we're also going to be talking about um, managing change and continuous improvement. Uh, later on, so we'll, we'll come back to a lot of these discussions. I'll get all of you to bring up these kinds of things as examples. Yeah, great.